Welcome to this second installment in a series of tutorials on how to construct simple logic gate programs using nothing but your Arduino, the serial monitor, and some code. In this video, we'll discuss a little of the theory behind the idea of a logic gate, some of the history that led up to what we today think of as a logic gate. Second, we'll look at the operation and core functionality of a particular logic gate, namely the AND gate, focusing on just what we need in order, like what we have to have in order to generate a piece of code that can simulate successfully the behavior associated with an AND gate. And third, we once we have that core functionality down and we know what it has to do at its most fundamental level the task it must perform successfully then we'll move into discussing how to actually think through designing a program to simulate and at the same time capture that behavior well as far as software can and we'll end up in this part actually doing a sketch of the program in the next video we will implement. We'll follow the sketch we design in this video in order uh, and use it as guidance during the implementation phase which will appear in the next video. So ultimately 1 through 3 is what we're focused on in this video. 4 we pick up next time. So to go to the very first part of our task, logic gates. Uh, the theory or a very little theory. If you want a really nicely laid out sort of extremely historically grounded discussion of the theory of logic gates, like what ideas were in had to be in place, maybe they didn't have to be in place, but that were in place over from 2,500 years ago, even further back than that in some cases, that all in some sense of you can tell a kind of crafty little story that links the contemporary notion of a logic gate all the way back to the to the Greeks 2,500 years ago. We're talking about you, your Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and particularly Aristotle. And you could very likely even push it further back in that the Greeks were a extremely trade focused and travel oriented culture and they had influences from all over the place you know from Persians to Asi Asiatic cultures etc etc so I don't know if I'd want to lay all the, the origin totally at the doorstep of the Greeks I would even have a tendency to go a little further back than the Greeks but you, in order to find an introduction that will say a whole lot more than I will in this short video all one needs to do is find this particular book and all you need to do is look at it's artificial artificial intelligence structures and strategies or complex problem solving. And all you one would need to do is look at the very first chapter in this book. The Luger goes through and gives a really nice, in a sense, it's even a more literary account of, of many of the major thoughts and shifts and turns throughout history. He starts with Aristotle and then pulls it all the way through people like um, all the way through your Bull and your Turing and your Tarski and all these people up until you reach the actual physical discrete component known today as a logic game. But, and it's really great. If you want a, whole, a really big picture, check out Luger. What we're going to do in terms of theory is just note a few things that you can approach the notion through philosophy that is kind of the historical precursors to the actual engineering that went into 
the logic data to discrete component. As far as philosophy goes, in philosophy, the notion, philosophy people will focus on the logic part in logic gate, whereas an engineering side may focus more on the gate, the mechanism, the, the widget that is doing something. And the, that's not an exclusive cut between those two, though, because, I, I mean, I've worked a long time in, in the domain of cognitive science, which has philosophers working with engineers and has psychologists working with, the, with all, all together in a big bundle. You're, you have your neuroscience people at a conference, you have your philosophy people, you have your engineers, and, all, and everybody's just trying to, he, trying to help one another to gain some grasp on what intelligence is or what mindedness is or what logic is and the different breeds of logic and how that could be implemented in an actual physical device, whether it be a physical device at the gate level, and in a lot of ways that may be taken care of, but the, just the, some, the sort of simple design that the particular ands, or and not, nans, nors, xors, etc., they that, that design has served us well as far as computers go. So maybe that's not so much what's at stake, but the different sorts of intelligence one might try to capture. That's where you'll get everybody mixed together and talking and working. And so in terms of philosophy, with the more focus on the logic and the mindedness and the intelligence like AI, etc., that what you're getting philosophy is there's this search that's gone on all the way back, Aristotle to previous, looking for something along the lines of like the rules or the laws that govern our thought processes. That That's sort of where the philosophy side of this comes in, is way back when with your Greeks, etc., there was this idea that we could ab abstract away from the brain or the body and think of the mind in terms of certain processes that are running on the top of just the, the bodily hardware, which that's contentious in contemporary philosophy of mind. Some people would say, well, you can't get a mind without a brain located in an environment filled with a world with widgets and post-it notes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My research is actually focused oftentimes over in that latter camp where there is you can't have a mind-body separation and think about it and make sense of either of the two without without one another. But historically it would there was a move to say, okay, could we perhaps trace or track down the certain rules or the laws that are helping our thought be reasonable and rational or logical is it how is it that we could track down things like necessary inferences those are the idea there is that say that you're exposed to a whole bunch of data and you look at that data and you do things like say okay well if those two bits of data are true then these other parts have to be true necessarily true and it's like if if it, it would just it would be totally unreasonable to think that if two or three certain bits of data are true that these other bits over here aren't necessarily true that's the domain of thinking in that kind of way of this necessarily true inference is the domain of deductive deductive logic I've taught quite a few classes in deductive logic and it focuses on notions like validity and soundness like and that's what I've been hovering over is this notion of validity that when is what's known in the philosophical logical mathematical sense an argument when is it valid well it's valid insofar as whenever its initiating conditions or its premises are true that its conclusions necessarily true and that can be broken down real simple that you're given us a, a certain set of sentences or data points and assuming those are true then what else has to also be true that's the sort of inference that move from assumed to be true pre premises or data to necessarily true conclusions that's the domain of deductive logic
Well, then there's other sorts of logic. There's inductive logic, which focuses on not so much, it focuses on probability. Like your probability, your statistical, statistical inferences. Now this you could say focuses on your necessarily true inferences. What has to be the case given certain other, pre, you know, previously assumed to be true information. That's deductive. Inductive is what is more or less probable given certain bits of data or information. Given that we can be 75% true about one set of data and 80% true about another, and then we have a particular context that we're thinking about a particular sample that hopefully is not relevantly biased. Most all data is biased, but hopefully it's not relevantly biased. Like an example would be if you wanted to get a gauge of the height of the average um, student on a university campus, you wouldn't stand outside the gymnasium a, right after basketball practice and try to use that as your sample population. Why? Well, because there's a very high probability that your readings are going to be extremely skewed to the high side because generally many people who play basketball, not all people, but many tend to be a little taller than the average height. So you would have, if you use that as your population, you would have a relevant bias that matters to your results and it, and it influences them in that case potentially in a negative way if you really want the sort of, you know, median height over a whole population of university students. So that's the domain of what inductive logic's looking at is inferences like that and Bayes rules, et cetera, et cetera. And it gets fully involved in that. It's a really interesting class. It's cool. Um, but and you get the same sort of idea in a mathematical setting with um statistics, etc. So that's one other domain. And keep in mind this is all about inference, which inferences um, are ways of thinking. They're connections between our thoughts. We go from one set of thoughts to another and the connection between that move, moving from one set to another. That's where, that's the domain of logic, those inferences. And then there's a new sort of logic. It's actually been around 100, 150 years and it's been talked about way before that, but it didn't really become concretized until you end up with people like Charles Peirce, etc., that talk about abductive logic. This is those split-second inferences we could make that the interesting bit about them is they tend to be accurate. Like, for example, if one's walking past a room and they hear something that sounds like a whole lot of barking going on in that room, their mind will immediately and, you know, in this particular culture, at least, go to something like, oh, there's a dog in that room. But that could be totally wrong because there's other animals that just as well could make barking noises, especially if it's behind a closed door. It could be a video of seals in the wild, or it could be pigs, pigs woof. And they make a pretty interesting woofing sound. Um, and it can be very similar to what a dog sounds like, a big dog. And so the idea is, it, is, is that those inferences, these little abductive inferences, are not guaranteed to be true almost in any way, but yet they often are. That's the domain of this abductive logic and a lot more intricate and subtle details. But that gets the impression that there's at least three ways we could break up logic in the sense of logical inferences, the connections between the way we think. And so that, and that's all, these are all ways or modes of trying to capture some sense or handle on the rules or the laws that govern our thought processes. And that's where the philosopher tends to approach the notion of logic. And that's how, in, in a deductive logic class, whenever I've mentioned things of the sort of like logic gates, I always tend to approach it from that, from that particular angle, the inferential angle. But this is n clearly not the only way that one can approach it. It's probably not the way that many people watching this video would have approached it or been exposed to it. Many people would have had the more engineering 
sort of starting point, which is to think about a logic gate in terms of a discrete component that performs a particular sort of operation. It's basically like a hardware realized sort of function. It's kind of like, like this diagram. It is a box that it pulls in inputs. It can be many more than two, and many times it often is. Then it can generate an output. I mean, it could generate multiple outputs too. It's just depending on how it is realized. But generally, you have multiple inputs and a single output. Yeah, in general, not all the time, though. And so the idea is it's a mechanism. It does something. It receives inputs. It processes those inputs, and then it kicks out or ejects an output down the line for other gates to pick up and do things with. And then these things are just multiplied in the millions, in the trillions, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea behind a logic gate in that context is something that's coming from things like how computers actually perform things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. It has to do with these sort of gates, and it has to do with the sort of binary encoding that's taking place at a really, really fundamental level. And even lower than binary, it's in voltages, highs, lows, or you know, ranges of voltages. Excuse me. And that's that's more of a, the way that I would interpret an engineering sort of approach is to think of the mechanism first. Now, the, clearly, there's theoretical engineering, so. I don't want to, you know, kind of tweak off any engineers. This is, I, I, tons of my friends are engineers. And it's just been my experience that they tend to think of these gates in terms of something that is a physically realized component. And that it, it's a solid, you know, it has a solid state. You can build it out of transistors. I'll have a video on how to do that later down the road, perhaps. And, or you can just buy the chip that has 16 or so pins and you three through hole chip or you can get a service mount version and you can build your own logic gate circuits build adders and half adders etc etc so you know and that's a slightly different approach but you got to think there has to be a connection between these two and there is because the sort of ideas searching for these rules and laws that govern our thought processes well, what is it that we hope to accomplish eventually with computers, or what do many people hope to accomplish, at least those working in cognitive science, is the realization of a sort of intelligence or rationality, that there is a rhyme and reason to all the electrons flying around and being herded around, is that it's like, if we could just get that down and in some way use our our own thought is an inspiration, kind of like a bio-inspired idea, like like bio-inspired robotics or behavior-based robotics. Is that that's a popular sort of um, and this is a popular sort of theoretical approach anymore to look at the natural world or look at the animals and say, hey, how might we realize some of that behavior in a machine or a little device and that makes it more interesting the idea behind it, what makes a really awesome video game oftentimes is that it feels intelligent it feels like the baddie might it might very well win you know it pits that human mind up against something that's highly interactive and that has a calculative sort of almost in some cases some video games a sadistic component where no matter how hard you try it, it just you just keep getting wiped out on a particular level well all of that is underneath all that is that that is that little twinkle of like intelligence like could that be captured well a, a logic gate is in my mind at least a, is one of the first sort of little components. I mean, ultimately, it was calculating machines and stuff with math. But a logic gate is is one step is one step a little bit away from the math. It's trying to get a little bit closer to the logic or the thought, you know. And so that's kind of some of the general, just the really really general touch and surface. If someone wanted to have a series of videos about deductive logic, the various logics and philosophy. I could definitely do them, and I, I would probably defer to some of my closer engineering friends to help along the way to get the, the, the true engineering perspective on it. But either way, that 
there is a is a confluence of thought. It's this old school philosophy stuff trickling down and it's slamming into the engineering and then when you hit contemporary cognitive science and AI studies these two are actually sharing a lot of the load and trying to help one another you know if you're an engineer you may say well, well I've never talked to a philosophy person now that may be true but there's a lot of engineers that have and I and I and out it's it's great these Engineers keep philosophy people humble and keep them out of the hybrid towers. And then the philosophy people will keep looking over the horizon like what could be, what could be. Engineers are looking over similar horizons, but sometimes really magical stuff happens when these two join one another. And that's why me I and me and my friends find it absolutely fascinating. So logic gates. Simply, it's a, if I was going to, say what is the overall idea behind a logic gate it is a physical way of attempting to realize some aspect of thought or intelligence in hardware and if you string enough of these together you get some truly amazing behavior namely what we're looking at in this very video that's really awesome I mean you know some people say oh well you know it could be three dimensions and projected in space and holographic yes it could be and you know, and some people work with things like that. But at the end of the day, to get a machine to generate an interface like this that we can interact with and do videos on top of running this program with a video recording program on top of it with an operating system in the background, et cetera, et cetera, that's awesome. Don't care who you are. That that's a really fancy sort of thing. So, and all of that comes about with this little simple gate. In this little simple gate, the thought processes are stretching way back when in history and in contemporary interchanges between these two domains, as well as the psychological sciences, the neuroscientists, et cetera, et cetera. There's tons of other fields that are approaching these things, but the gate is kind of established as it is. So, that being said, to move to the second part, if someone wants a longer, more winded discussion of the theory, I'll be glad to oblige them. But for now, good enough. Theory, check. Very little theory. Now, the AND gate, the operation. This is the first gate we're going to try to build a pro program to simulate its behavior. So what we really need to understand is the operation of this gate. How does it function at the core? What does it do? Well, at the, at the general level, it takes in two inputs. It can take in 150 inputs, but... At its most simple level, you generally think of it as taking in two inputs, it performs an operation, and it ejects an output. Now, the more philosophical approach to this is going to start with what's known as a truth table for this AND gate. It's going to, philosophy people would approach the AND as a conjunction, like an AND in a sentence. Think about it, we express our thoughts oftentimes in sentences. So how do you capture the rules governing thoughts? Oh, well, you look at the sentences and you look at the truth functional connectives. That's the philosophical, logical means of walking into the notion of ands, ors, and nots. And all this trickles down to someone like Boole that did Boolean algebra. And then he symbolized this stuff and made it so it could be more formal and abstracted and we could do proofs. You know, not the sense of, I have proof, you know, that Elvis is alive. No, it's more like, given some bits of data, what inferences can we draw that, are, that ensure either necessarily true conclusions or higher, lower probability conclusions or... Um, you know, or abduction, that's going to, you know, that, that's a little harder to latch down to. But there seems to be a logic to abductive inference, too. But at the end of the day, true tables. They're expressed in terms of trues and falses. But true and false, uh, in philosophy, there's 10, 15 different major theories of what truth is and truthiness. And there's tons of disagreement. So for as far as this goes, you could just as well think of it as ones and zeros as far as implementing in a piece of software and you'd be just as fine. Like the computer itself, uh, the device that we can create today, it doesn't really have a sense of trueiness or false. It's more like high-low volts or, you know, 
how you know five volts no volts 3.3 volts no volts so you know basically with your Arduino it's a it's great at detecting and doing stuff based off of voltage levels that's a microcontroller at its core you know what does a potentiometer do you're varying voltage levels what does a light sensor do it varies voltage levels how do you turn a transistor on you vary a voltage level etc 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 you're, you're messing with voltage and of course voltage comes along with current resistance you know ohms but but at the end of the day that 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 pressure that voltage that you know that pressure potential energy voltage that's where the the core is so you can think i mean even this ones and zeros is higher level it's an abstraction from what you would actually maybe want to say at the physical level of the electrons but it's good enough to understand the core functionality to realize and implement it in software true or false ones or zeros i'll talk in terms of true or false as we're designing the program but if that bothers you, just think in terms of ones and zeros, highs and lows, whatever you prefer. If it's a binary distinction, it'll work for deductive. Um, so how does this work? Well, the AND gate. Ultimately, it's got the simplest of simplest, simplest of functionality. That reading from left to right, or first just look at the two columns here. We have a column for input one, we have a column for input two. Since we have two inputs, there's only four possible combinations those inputs could be arranged in. Namely, they could both be true, they could both be false, or the first one could be true, the second one false, the first one false, the second one true. That's all your range that exhausts the possibilities when you have just two input states. And you have two options for those input states, they're either true or they're false. So, well, what is special about the AND gate? What does it do? Well, Whenever both of its inputs are true, then its output is true. Otherwise, in all other cases, the other three combinations that the inputs might hit that gate in and enter that AND processing operation, they're going to eject falses. So in all cases where both of the AND's inputs are true, the AND gate's inputs are true, or the conjunction's inputs are true, however you want to refer to or think of AND, the output's going to be true. Otherwise, you're going to get a false output. You can shift over to the ones and zeros if it helps. In all cases where both inputs receive a one or a high, then the output's going to be high or it's going to be a one. In all other possible combinations of those two inputs gates, you're going to get a false or a zero. So, and that's basically, from that we could pull, like I've been iterating, is this definition or behavioral rule that's associated with AND gates. Namely, an AND gate's output is true, or it's a 1, whenever both of its inputs are true, or they're both 1s. Otherwise, its output is false, or is a 0. So, really, what we'd have to capture when we step down in program design is we really want to capture that core functionality. If we built a piece of software that gave us a true when the first input's false and the second one's true, we ended up with a true over here, then we know we've done something wrong because that's not the core functionality of the AND gate. And every logic gate, that's what distinguishes them. If you laid out a whole bunch of integrated logic gate circuits on a table, if you didn't know the numbers, you wouldn't be able to even tell what they were. And, and just knowing even if you know the numbers and say, oh, this is an OR gate, this is a NOR gate, and here's a XNOR or whatever, that until you understand that core functionality, each one manifests a particular output behavior given a certain pattern of input behaviors. That's the core behavior and functionality of any logic gate you ever encounter, is that given a certain set of inputs, it's going to produce a certain predetermined set of outputs as long as it's not broken or shorted out etc you know the real world this is this is the idealized behavior and the idealized behavior is what we'd like to capture and emulate or simulate in software so this is what we've got to capture well with that in mind how might we design a program and this is the thought process that's so important this is to take that second of thought so ultimately no matter what we do, we're going to have to have in our piece of software something that, like, some test or some sort of 
function that um, captures the behavioral uh, we can say it that way behavioral rule associated with AND gates that's the core and oftentimes when you're designing a piece of software if you can figure out the core like what it the most fundamental level is this supposed to do is it supposed to um, recognize when the the gas is low in the tank and send a low fuel light to the driver if it's like a fuel gauge piece of software or it's monitoring you know a lever float mechanism or whatever magnetic hall effect mechanism whatever way it's realized in the tank you don't really have to get so caught up in that initially in a sketch some in a program sketch so much as what is the core functionality that it in some sense recognizes in scare quotes that the fuel level has dropped below a set threshold that we wanted it that at that point it's like the point of no return if the you know and we need to send a light or a bell or a ding or something to the operator to let them know hey you may want to get some gas well that's the same sort of idea here is we're trying to capture a similar thing with this like we need a test or a function that captures the behavioral rule associated with the AND gate its core functionality we, we want a rule now we can expand this to say something like that we want it to like we want it to be able to like test and say if both inputs are true then set output set output to true otherwise set output false that's what we ultimately want to capture with this sort of central or core functionality we want if, if we're not capturing this we've not built an AND gate program so now that's the core so now we got to start this is the process and the input process output you know generic picture of all sorts of things computation or functional now we need something with those inputs so let's see what we would need is we need some way to collect given that this is going to be a user controlled program we'll need some means of collecting user inputs plural or collect user input times two at least at this point we know that this AND gate that we're looking at up here takes in an input one and input two so we'll need some way to retrieve user input and in the case of the programs we're going to be building it's going to be via the serial monitor so that gives us some sense of what needs to come before this test like we'll grab this input find some way to grab up the input from the user run it through this test and then well what are we what are we going to do after we've ran it through the test oh well we'll need to display the output to user we'll need some means of displaying it well we have the serial monitor so that's going to be you know we can talk about the actual Arduino code and just you know when we get there but at the moment this is the, the like the three major things like it like if we were going to do like the major moves that are going to take place in this piece of software we're thinking about designing here it needs to do these three things well is that enough though would that get us to the end well in principle yes but what about the user don't they need some set of instructions like don't they need to know like say if there's some special condition on the sort of output that I, or input that our programs designed to read and pick up and I mean are we gonna accept is this are these inputs is the, is the software gonna accept them in the term of single characters or is it gonna accept them in terms of whole character string an array of you know a character array of various characters that we can use as a string you know like are we going to let people spell out the word true 
and false and tell them that's how they need to enter the information or are we just going to tell them to enter a T for true and F for false or a 1 or a 0 etc so that all of that thinking there is just that's the hallmark of a need for some sort of like display user instructions like any special instructions for the user and I mean it would be nice if we welcome user to program just make our program polite you know and that can take place really in the same part of the code and that would seem like now we're getting close to the very beginning is you could say yeah we need to welcome that user to the program say how do you do this is the AND gate program and here's what you need to do to effectively interact with this program you know you don't want to be typing in things like dog and cat and expect this AND gate program to behave as an AND gate would it's going to not recognize that sort of inputs so we need that display user instructions or special instructions so at this point we would need to move up our step one and then our step two and our step three like what, what we're trying to capture in this discussion is this sort of thought processes involved in designing a piece of software that would simulate AND gate behavior now let's think um, the AND gate takes it could go through in principle four different iterations like both the user could put both inputs is true, the user could put the first one is true, the second one is false, the first one false, the second one true, or both of the first, of both inputs is false. That's at least four iterations through that piece of software. That indicates that there's got to be some sort of loop mechanism that's, that's holding all of this together. And there has to be. And so, well, what would that be like? There's many ways one could do this, and one of the simplest ways is generally ask them if they want to run it again. Like, do you want to run this program again? Or more simply, play again, just like any old video game. Or even if you're playing chess or checkers or Chinese checkers, etc., etc. Normally, if you've enjoyed the game, well, you want to play again. So, and that's always an option. So, this gives the sort of idea of a loop. It's like the per we can welcome them to the program. We can display the instructions to them once they've read them and hopefully understood them. They enter some inputs. We collect it via the serial monitor, and we and we can do it two times, keeping everything simple, just really straightforward. Once we have that input collected then we can drop down into our test or our function that, that captures that rule associated with the AND gate see if both of them are true or see if what if either of the inputs is false we're going to throw a false out of the tail end so and we know that but so we can run those two inputs through this test and then based on the outcome of that test either drop and display to the user a true on the screen or a false on the screen it's real simple it's just two way so then once the output's displayed on the screen well they would have been through one possibility of the AND gate remember it has four if they entered two trues the first time the output's going to be true but the user won't really know what the other outputs would be until he or she enters it so we'll need the ability to prompt them to play again and then it'll rotate around and come back to that first step and that's your loop. That's an overall looping structure that we're going to have to couch all of this stuff in. We're going to have to have some way. So that's the major five steps. But now we can go to the next step. This is like if we were doing sketching, this is your like your skeletal lines of the drawing. This is the drawing with no color. This is the drawing without any shading. This is the true sketch. Well, let's move in a little deeper, though. Like, in terms of if we're collecting user inputs and we're doing it times two, well, are we going to need an input function times two? Or would just one do? And also keep in mind that that play again is going to be pulling in some kind of input, 
I mean, there's going to have to be some sort of input collection function associated with this, too. I mean, there's going to be an input collection function associated with the play again. There's going to be some sort of input collection function associated here, too. So couldn't we perhaps just have one function that would just collect input in general? And then be able to call it like three times, two here, one there. So say a special purpose get input function. <coughs> yeah, so why not think about a special purpose get input function? That sounds plausible that we can use in, at the fifth stage and two times up at the second stage. Oh, that seems reasonable. Seems like maybe a good idea. Well, then once we have that input, we've got to drop into this function or test for that behavior rule associated with the AND gate. Well, you could do that in the body of the code because it's a simple test in the end. But why not kind of fancy things up and have like a special purpose AND gate function? Why not? I mean, that would give us two different little functions that we can create and learn about creating functions with in the context of this program. I mean, the truth be told, you could simulate AND gate behavior without using any special purpose, you know, declared, established, defined functions. You could do it. People have done it. I have done it. But it does tend to make the program a little more explicit. Like if we say, here's the input function, and the user's entering input. It's like, oh, yeah, that's the input collection function. I expect the user to dump some characters or integers or whatever down that, and then it's going to hand off to some well, this function, this special purpose AND gate function. And then if you really wanted to be, you know, fancy, you got to keep in mind the Arduino's got a limited amount of memory, and function calls take up memory. So if we're not going to exhaust it, even if we did, perhaps we could do a special little purpose output function to display it to the user. We could also go crazy and have a play again function. You know, we could have all of these handing off you know, values to one another. But is just to keep things simple at this moment, this is probably all we need. And a person can go forward and add more later if they want to. But so that being said, we kind of have a just the idea here that we're going to welcome the user to the program, display these instructions. Where would this take place? This, we're only going to do this one time. As soon as the program's initiated, well, there is a inbuilt program structure that executes one time, just when the program initiates. And anybody familiar with the Arduino knows that it's void setup. So <coughs> this is where this void setup would make the most sense as to where to locate this stuff. It's right there. It runs when the program starts up, and it never runs again. And so, well, we're using, we're going to display user instructions, display them to what? Well, the serial monitor. So we can have void setup, and let's just think about this. We'd have void setup, and well, if we're going to use the serial monitor, we're going to have to initiate a serial connection. So serial.begin. 9600 baud's fine. And a serial connection, some, sometimes you know, a computer or laptop takes a little while to establish that connection, so we can give it a little time to breathe. A delay of 50 milliseconds is plenty. doesn't matter. It's unnoticeable by most users. So when the program initiates, we will display some message. So we got a serial connection. We got a delay. So at this point, it would be something like welcome welcome message and special instructions that's where they would go is in that void setup now well let's move down again and let's think we are collecting user inputs well we're gonna have to have something to store those user inputs in they're gonna have to be 
And those things are going to vary between each iteration through the program. They could, in principle at least. Well, if they're varying, that's a perfect example of what we might need some variables for. And variables tend to go before anything else, if they're global at least. So we could think in terms of, you know, having some global variables. I mean, we wouldn't have to make them global, but we can in this context because we're not going to have, you know, 50 functions interacting and manipulating and changing a lot of values. We're not going to have that many global variables. So, so in principle, some, something like this, yes, global variables, not like a big case of emergency. Well, at this point is when the true decision time comes about. What sort of variable type do we need? Well, that's going to be dependent on what sort of way we, what sort of inputs we're going to want this special purpose input function to make sense of. Well, we could do whole words or strings, but one of the simplest ways is to do it with just single characters, like a T for true and F for false. That's really simple. That's really straightforward. Or a one or a zero. If you did one or a zero, you could stick to the int type. And that may be something you would prefer to do and mess with the numerics. But given my, you know, tendency toward philosophy stuff, let's just say we're going to use a character type. Well, we'll use two of them. Make it even, you know, spread out. Let's do two global variables. One for input one and one for input two. And we would need to initialize these, or would we? You know, eh, we could, but do we need to? Not really. They'll have they'll have garbage values, whatever's in the register. But we're going to pick them up almost immediately as soon as what setup has been operative. I mean, immediately for us as the user. In terms of the microcontroller, it's going to be eons. But can it really get us into much trouble if we don't? Go ahead, if we just declare them here, well, not really. I think we'll be pretty safe to do that. So we'll have inputs for input one, input two. Now, would we need any more input variables? Well, let's think about that. Down here at play again, we've said we're going to probably use an input collection function. Well, that's going to be pulling in some inputs. And true or false probably won't make a whole lot of sense. In the play again, do you want to play again? True. Well, you could do that, you know, if you wanted to keep it in the spirit of the philosophic notion of logic. But a simple yes or a no would probably suffice. So why not have like some other level variable, a character, and we could name it all kinds of things. We could go, you know, the yn variable, the yes no name for it, whatever you want. Um, I tend to just think just character simple enough, CH, abbreviation of a character. Now you could go yes, no, you do whatever you want to do. The play again, you could do that, have play again variable there. Whatever helps you and helps a reader make sense of it. CH is probably not the best choice for readability and figuring it out, but it's such a simple program, I'm not going to get hung up in what one wants to name that particular global variable. But to make it explicit, we can say something like, this will be replay, associated with replay, and this will be just like it says. It will be associated with input 1. This will be associated with input 2. Input 2. And so this will be associated with replay. So, or the play again. So now, uh, we that will probably get us by. So now, where to now? Let's see. Let's keep looking around. Okay, we're going to collect those, collect those inputs. And we've got to think now about that second programming structure that every Arduino sketch has to have, namely void loop. And there is, there's that loop. And it's a pesky one, too, because it's going to want to repeat unless we put some control structure to, to dictate if it repeats or not. It's going to spin and spin and spin. And so uh, we might need some control structure for that. Let's think about that. We want it to display a welcome message, collect some user input, test that input against our behavior rule associated with AND, display that output to the user, then ask the user do they want to play again. If they say yes, we want this thing to loop back up. 
If they say no, well, we don't want it to loop. We want it to exit, run away, you know, be done, stop this program. Well, that's going to be really hard to to achieve in void loop, given that it's an infinite loop. It's got a uh, underneath this is a you know a for structure that looks like that. You know, uh, you know the source for void loop. Uh, well, you know, according to what we mean by source, but the next level down, you're looking at an infinite loop. It's going to spin continuously. Well, that doesn't leave much room for a play again. It's going to be not, a, you know, do you want to play again? Yes. And it's going to kick them right back up here immediately. Well, we've got to figure out some way to control that. Well, there's a simple structure that I tend to like is to... Think in terms of an if test. So say I have some start variable, and if that start variable is true, then, so do we want to start void loop again? Well, look at start. Is start true? Well, if it is, then start it again. And that's, that's, that's pretty good. And so we can make some other sorts of control structures to toggle whether starts true or false before we get to the very end of void loop and say if we toggle it false then it halts void loop so that it doesn't keep it doesn't roll back around and spin again so somewhere down here we're going to need some way to to let's see we'll need to be able to set start to false if user doesn't to play again or to leave it true if well, you know not a perfect English sentence by any means but it communicates what we're ultimately going to have to have in there is like set start defaults if the user does or set it defaults if the user doesn't want to play again or leave it at true if he or she does want to play again because we're and so leave it at true well what is that implying that's implying that we're going to have to have some variable and why not make it global just to be simple that will dictate whether void loop is going to spin again or not and it's a tr it's going to be we're going to test start for true well that's the other option's fault so that just screams boolean of the boolean type we're talking about boolean connectives ands ors and nots hmm. it's just it kind of it seems kind of nice to be exploiting the boolean inbuilt boolean type to build a logic gate program so let's say we want to start out with start is true we will need to initialize that start variable why well because as soon as it runs through the setup it's going to hit void loop and then it's going to be testing is start true well the first time through we want it to go on through and run the program ask for user inputs so we will want start to be true and then later down the road we can dictate whether it toggles the faults you know set up some other test so that gives us or give us total control over void loop when it when it spins around again or not okay so now we want to collect those user inputs via the serial monitor okay so at this point we're gonna need our collect or even simpler get input function and we're gonna have to call that and we're also and we're going I guess we can call it again and get the other one so yeah we could do that and we can do that by way of controlling what these what these function calls return as long as we have a handle on their return values we'll have a handle on what you know what they are assigned to so we could like assign the first call of the get input or the get input function to input one variable and we could assign the second one to something like input two and just have this as a general purpose get the input function well now that we're going to be building special purpose functions it's 
not not really always necessary but it may be nice to put in some function prototypes up here once we build those functions we'll probably want to include their prototypes so that the compiler can get a peek at them as soon as it starts reading this program and converting it into hex we'll want it, it's always nice to give it a peek so we may need some we'll, we'll definitely need some prototypes and so this would get our inputs and then after we got our inputs, we'd want like probably to call some kind of AND gate function, like AND gate function. And what do we want it to do? Well, we want it to take in those two kind of inputs. Well, those kind of inputs are what? Well, they're going to be the car type or character type. So there'd be a character like input one, and then there'd be another character input two. And you, you know, and we have to keep in mind that this is basically, it's not, this will be a copy of our input variables. It'll be a copy of them. It won't be the actual variables. <laughs> you know, so, but given that we're working with these globals up here, we can update them. Because these functions will be able to access anything outside of themselves. So we can we can make that work. And we could call that and dump these in it. But this looks more like a function prototype. Um, it'll actually end up being take the types away. And it'll look something like this. It'll be your input 1s and input 2s. And then, well, what do we need it to do after it's done that? Oh, it's got to, you know, it'll test. And what's being returned out of the AND? Well, it's going to be something, some sort of output is going to be returned out of the AND. Hmm. Hmm. So, well, we may figure out we can do it a little more cleanly than this as we go along. But just sketching it, that looks okay. Doesn't look, you know, too suspicious, anything... You know, nothing's overly out of whack. And from here, where would we go? Hmm. Well, let's see. Hmm. We may or may not need to return something from that AND function. We'll, we'll assess that when we, when we get started in the implementation and start filling these things in in the next video. But either way, we got output. So at this point, what do we have left? We've got something to collect the inputs update some variables, you know, then exploit the values of those variables here, and then we would eject the outputs, and then what do we want to do? Well, we will um, need to do a certain sort of play again. Hmm. So how do we do play again? Well, we're going to need to collect some input, it would, I would think. And well, what are we using with that play again? Well, we're going to use this car type character that ch so have the ch capture the return value of a third call to the get input function and this is going to be a single character like a yes or a no so with that in mind how might we make this thing replay keeping in mind we've got this overall if control structure well what we could do is something like if that ch is like um if it happened to be equal to say a yes character then we could do something like say start equals true it remains true and then or else the other option is that they enter something besides a yes, which would be an N for no. Then at that point, we could do something like starts equals false. Then we could close that down and then tighten this up. And this would be the, the control structure for our play again. Yeah, that would work. And yeah, and we probably, you know, could
like doing this is a little sloppy that they could it just like depending on the way we did the unless we do the get input function and give it some way to do some error handling or not error handling but like exception handling or something where it's like okay what happens if they enter instead of a t and f or a y or a y or an n character what if they enter the number two you know, we may need something in an input function to, you know, kind of say, oh, well, if it's not these acceptable characters, then let them know that. You know, there may need to be some sort of, you know, error checking going on there. And, okay, so we've, so at this point, we this particular part of the code, edit, cut, it would actually be showing up right here. this would be a decent description of what's happening right there at this point the code set the start defaults if the user don't want to play again or leave it to truth if he or she does want to play again that's exactly what this would be doing so now at this point what would we need at the bottom under void loop or we could put it up here and not even have to do it we could put it here and not really have to deal with function prototypes, but let's just locate our special functions down here. We would need a get input function and we would, you know, we need that and then we're also going to need something like an and gate function. We're going to have to define those there. And every sort of function is going to have to have a type that's going to specify the type of its return value. So we could get even fancier and think about that. Well, input is going to be returning to input 1 and input 2. Well, input 1 and input 2 are of the character type. So we could already kind of know that it's going to be a character as far as the get input function goes. And then the AND is going to be returning into what? Well, this output's, you know, a little suspicious. Um, we may or may not have it returning anything. But if it doesn't return anything, it's going to be void. So we'll see. We'll see how that works. Um, as far as get input function goes, do we need any sort of parameters? I don't think so. I think we'll be able to do just fine so we can go void, meaning no parameters. Then the input function, we've already kind of sketched it out right there. It's input 1, input 2. So that's going to be, you know, of the character type. And then they're going to, of course, you know, they will perform, perform, input collection that's the task that particular function would do and this <clears throat> and this one would be um, evaluate inputs based on and rule yeah so that, that would based on some embodiment or test setup that we can do for the AND rule. And then the character with the with the um input, we're going to have some way to or I have to have some way to retrieve some sort of code structure to retrieve those characters coming from the serial monitor, recognize them, and then return them out to those input 1 and input 2 variables. But just looking at it, that's not a bad sketch. That kind of gets us a whole lot of structure, which this is a far from completed program, but we at least know that in void setup we're going to if we're probably before we get a voice set up we're going to need some global variables these are good sort of starting points that will pro function prototypes that'll just be you know these we'll prototype those no problem then in setup we're going to initiate the serial
um, connection, delay just a second to give it time to stabilize. We'll display a welcome message, special instructions to the user. Then we'll hit void loop. We'll test to see is the start variable true. It will be the first time through the loop. And so it would run through. It would collect the input, the first input. It will collect the second input. It will run the AND gate function. May or may not have an output variable. We'll see. And then the second time we'll run the input, the get input function to ask does the user want to play again. Now um, that particular message will probably be here, like um, as far as um, the user goes, will be something like do you want to play again? Enter Y for yes, N for no. Something to that effect right ahead of when we start um, polling that um, the Arduino will start checking its serial receive buffer to see if there's any characters in its buffer. So we could prompt the user, then kick in immediately to this function, have it wait until characters show up in the receive buffer, and then do something and eject a return value of either will it be a character. Why couldn't it just be a simple yes? or a no, the Y character or the N character. If it was, well then this if structure here would work. You know, and we may need, like I mentioned, you know, if they enter an S or a Q or a dollar sign, we may want to build some little code in there to handle that. But just looking at this in the overall, that's not a bad sketch. That's a sketch of what this thing could look like during implementation, just the high, the highlights, and we've added a little bit of color and some shading, but it's still not not definitive. So that would be enough for us to say that we've at least walked through the design process and sketched a guide for how we might want to organize our information in this program. So. That, this will be where we'll pick, off, pick up in the next video, we, and we will actually write the code for an entire AND gate program. After we have it, it's, just simple, it's a simple matter of changing a few print statements and changing, you know, tweaking a test condition inside an OR gate function or a NOT gate function, etc., etc., and we can generate a program for every other logic gate there is. But they will all manifest this similar stru uh, structure, similar to this. In the case of the not, there'll only need to be one input. But for all the others, two is going to be our minimum for all of those. So at this point, I hope this tutorial has been helpful. Um, my apologies if it went a little longer than one might have hoped. But I hope it's been helpful. And if you like this video, please subscribe. and. To my channel and click like. Thank you.